Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here. I haven't sprung one of these on you in a long time. A special episode for something timely that was right up my alley. Over the years, I've learned that so many CHP listeners have a keen interest in Chinese military history, and I get a lot of requests to cover some of the most historically and noteworthy battles, rebellions, and wars, and tell stories about some of the military heroes of China. Well, today I am so pleased to invite on the China History Podcast Mr. Ian McCollum, another kindred spirit with a passion for history. Ian's host of the Forgotten Weapons channel on YouTube that is a go-to source for information about firearms used throughout modern history going back to the 19th century. And some of these weapons are very obscure and are packed with history and great stories. And Ian's a well-known and respected authority among enthusiasts of antique and historical firearms. And that is not a niche market by any stretch of the means. This is something that has worldwide interest. He's got a new book coming out called Pistols of the Warlords, Chinese Domestic Handguns, 1911 to 1949. And we're here to discuss a bit of history that well, up till now, hasn't enjoyed as deep of a dive that this book is going to offer. He only walked into my life a couple weeks ago, Ian, but in that short time, what a world you've opened up to me. I've learned so much. Ian McCollum, welcome to the China History Podcast. A great honor to have you on. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. It's, it's exciting to be here. So let's get right into the warlord era. You're in Shirkai. Died in June 1916, and from that point on, all his loyalists serving as governors out in the provinces transformed into warlords, and this era lasted until the conclusion of the Central Plains War in 1930. And in between Yuan's death and the day Chiang Kai-shek declared mission accomplished, there were quite a few battles, and along with the wreckage they caused in China... No small amount of colorful history was left behind by these warlords. Despite all the damage they did to their nation, they left behind quite a legacy of anecdotes. So let me ask you, in a typical warlord army, what kind of weapons did a common foot soldier carry? That's actually a much easier question to answer than if you had brought up, say, any of the European armies of the time. Uh, the warlord armies were generally pretty simple. Uh, the typical soldier carried a bolt-action rifle, typically something copied from or modeled on a uh, Mauser 98 pattern, uh, possibly a German Gewehr Model 88, uh, or possibly a Japanese Arasaka. There, were, there was very little use of heavy weapons in these armies, things like artillery, uh, some of it was certainly around, but the you know artillery uh, guns themselves were relatively scarce. Ammunition for them was difficult to come by. Uh, some of the warlords had some armed aircraft that might have had some bombs. Uh, they might have had an armored train or two. But by and large, the typical soldier carried a bolt-action rifle of the 1890s or 1900s vintage sort of technology. And what about, uh, let's say, an officer or, or even a warlord? I honestly have no idea what a warlord specifically would have carried himself. Uh, most likely something imported from Europe or the United States. Uh, obviously, I would expect it to be the best quality uh, that he could find and that money could buy at the time. Uh, officers would have been more likely armed with a handgun, uh, possibly also a rifle, but probably a handgun. Um, there were some submachine guns in warlord arsenals at the time, um, in particular the Bergman submachine gun. Um, out of Switzerland and Germany, uh, was copied by some of the Chinese arsenals and produced. But more typically, you'd be looking at a handgun as something, not so much as a fighting tool, but as a, a token of office, which is how handguns were largely treated in European armies and, well, all armies at the time. Uh, one of the things that makes the warlord armies a little bit distinct is they actually use um, Mauser C96 style pistols in a way that's a bit different from other armies. Uh, at the time. And that is, I should back up a little bit. The, the C96 Mauser was an early style, uh, an early pattern of handgun that is particularly distinctive for having a shoulder stock that can attach to it. Uh, it was a relatively large gun. It was relatively imposing. Um, and it proved to be fairly popular on the commercial market in Europe and extremely popular in China. And it was used as sort of an interim 
uh, a weapon that was faster firing and more maneuverable and easier to carry than a full-size rifle, uh, but much more effective in combat than a simple handgun. And the warlord armies, at least some of them, had whole whole units who were armed with essentially shoulder-stocked pistols as sort of shock troops. And that's something in Western armies, you would see that done with submachine guns, perhaps. Um, the Russian army would do that extensively in World War II. But the use of stocked pistols in this role is really pretty much unique to China at this time. Of the uh, collection of pistols presented in the book, do you think this this represents the tip of the iceberg of what was produced or imported into China during the warlord era? How comprehensive is the collection photographed in the book, do you think? That was one of my big concerns. So um, to step back a little bit, the book that I'm I've put together it was based on a collection of about 250 of these pistols um, of, of all the major types that were actually manufactured in China. Uh, so we know some of the guns that were imported into China, and we can talk about those, but they're not included in the book, except as comparisons when your imported models were copied by Chinese arsenals or workshops. So one of my big concerns in putting the book together was exactly this question of, Am I missing things? Is this collection representative of what was manufactured overall? And the conclusion I'm very happy to say that I've come to is I think this this book and this collection that I built it from um, really are quite representative. There are I've been able to to look at a number of much smaller collections, including collections, well, photographically look at, not in person, but uh, smaller collections in China. And what I'm happy to say is I don't see really any examples of, of types that aren't represented in the book. So what I have in general are, are four overall uh, types of Chinese manufactured pistols. We have copies of the, the Mauser C96. We have copies of the FN 1900, which was an early uh, sort of a small officer's pistol made in Belgium. We have copies of a variety of other imported arms, because basically everything that was available on the market during this time period was imported into China in at least some quantity. And everything that came over was fair game to be copied. Uh, And then there's a whole section on unique domestic Chinese designs, which to my mind are are the most interesting. Have you you aware of any other well-known collections of pistols from the warlord era outside the usa you were, were you able to locate uh, any other collectors maybe in china hong kong southeast asia taiwan yeah who else uh, had collections that were able to add to what you were able to write about and photograph i was not able to find anything nearly as comprehensive as as the the main collection that i built this book around and that was that was a collection that was put together over the course of more than three decades by a, a truly dedicated and interested collector in this specific subject. Um, uh, however, uh, a few years ago, there was another, a much smaller collection, but probably a couple dozen examples that came up for sale in the United States that I was able to study. Um, I've been able to find a couple other collections in, in institutions in Southeast Asia, as you say. Um, the China Military Chinese Military Museum in Beijing has a couple dozen of them on display. Uh, the Armed Forces Museum in Taipei has a number of them. And so while those those guns don't get into the book because I didn't have physical access to photograph them, I was able to study them photographically and confirm that they, they fall into the same categories and patterns that I've uh, differentiated in the book. How were these pistols used or allocated in the uh, warlord armies? Very sparsely. (laughs) So what makes these so interesting as handguns is that no two of them are actually alike. There are distinctive patterns that share a lot of common features. But in the book, for example, we have two guns that actually have sequential serial numbers and on which the serial numbers appear to be legitimate serial numbers. And even those two pistols show different features. And the reason for this is and and we'll talk about the the arsenal system in China in a few minutes, I think. But the arsenals would get an order for a large number of firearms from a particular warlord. And this would be primarily rifles, because that's what the army was primarily armed with. But you would want, with well, the warlord, would want a small number of handguns for his officers. 
But the handgun quantities were never sufficient to justify setting up a full actual production line for handguns the way that rifles did. You might have a warlord order 10,000 rifles and, say, 50 pistols. So the rifle orders go on to a production line. Uh, A lot of these arsenals have been set up with uh, European or American technical assistance, and they make guns just like we would expect, one part at a time, all identical. Well, for a small number of handguns, the arsenal would typically do something like take its couple of best uh, artisan gunsmiths and say, all right, each of you guys, you five guys, each need to produce 10 pistols this month to complete this order. And each gun would be made from scratch, one at a time, piece by piece, put together, hand-fitted, completed, set aside, start the next one. And so each craftsman has his own style, and the, there are a number of decorative features that you'll see on these guns that vary widely, and I would attribute to individual craftsmen preference, perhaps preference of whoever was ordering these pistols. Like maybe they want a little bit longer barrel, maybe they want a shorter barrel, maybe they want this feature or that feature. But because the guns are all completely unique, they make a a fascinating array to study. You know, you take five American Colt 1911 pistols and look at them side by side, and they're all completely identical. You take five Mm -hmm. of these Warlord era pistols, and every one of them has something different about it. Um, So I suppose to get back to the actual question, uh, pistols were generally allocated in small numbers to officers they probably weren't used all that much, with the exception, as we discussed, of the C-96s that were actually combat weapons. Pistols were primarily a token of rank or perhaps a last-ditch self-defense weapon. Which uh, foreign countries were dealing in pistols or firearms or ordnance? Any notable arms manufacturers at that time? Or was most everything produced locally in Chinese arsenals? Basically, anyone who is making guns over this period, and this extends back, the the beginning of this system extends before the the revolution in 1911. Uh, But basically, every major manufacturer uh, in the world was selling guns into China at one point or another. Now, there are some interesting ebbs and flows to this, the sources of weapons. Uh, In 1919, there was an arms embargo set up against China uh, by basically the victorious powers from World War I. but it wasn't signed by everybody. So it was signed by Great Britain, by France, by Russia, by the United States. But it wasn't signed, for example, by the newly formed state of Czechoslovakia. And so you will see a lot of Czech firearms uh, that were sold into China. It wasn't, sold, it wasn't signed by Switzerland. Um, the SIG company, uh, which still exists today, uh, SIG sold a bunch of actually quite interesting and unusual firearms into China at the time. There was a massive demand, as you know, understanding more about the warlord era, there's a massive demand for arms of any kind that could be imported. Um, outside, the, the arms embargo eventually was was dropped. Um, and you will find imported guns that went into China uh, from Germany, massive numbers of C96 Mausers. Um, China actually accounts for the majority of C96 pistols ever manufactured. The majority of them were shipped to China. Um, a lot of pistols from Spain, a lot of pistols from Belgium, Everybody was happy to take orders. And it, it's because, in part, they weren't dealing with a single unified national government. They were dealing with this multitude of warlords. And any time one of these warlords, especially the ones who were located on the coasts, who had access to ports and shipping you know, possibilities, anytime they got some money, whether it was from fleecing all of their peasant citizens or from some sort of international loan, they were much more inclined to purchase guns from outside than to try and manufacture them. You buy it from outside, it shows up, you know the quality is great, and it's there and it's done. If you try and set up your own manufacturing, there's a lot more risk and a lot more time involved. One thing, uh, the book shows a prodigious amount of markings on so many of the pistols in the collection that well, they seem to make no sense whatsoever. What's up with that? That was like uh, really a trip. Why all these letters and arbitrary numbers? And were they engraved, painted? How were they applied? What, what was up with that? So generally speaking, the guns that were produced by Chinese arsenals have markings that make sense. Uh, They will have specific arsenal symbols on them to indicate where they were made. They will often be dated. They will have serial numbers that run in sequence and, and all make sense, just like you would expect from any other professional arsenal. The guns that were handmade, which includes most of these pistols, don't have any of that. Instead, what they were generally trying to do was... And a lot of this, I should say, is 
theoretical because we don't have any written records of exactly what was going on. Um, but these markings are attempts to make the guns look like imported European pistols because the imported guns were known to be of excellent quality. You get a pistol from FN in Belgium or from Mauser in Germany, it's going to be great. You know, quality is as good as you could get. So if you are an individual craftsman making a pistol, what you would typically do is copy the markings that one would expect to see on the real deal. And the people that we're talking about here, both the manufacturers and the clients, generally speaking, were not literate in Western languages. They didn't speak German or French or English. Um, a lot of them, frankly, were not literate in written Chinese either. So the comparison I like to make uh, would be to, <laughs> this may not be the most flattering comparison, but to like the American frat boy who goes and gets a Chinese character tattoo on his arm. And he thinks he knows knows what it means, and maybe it's maybe he maybe he's right, but he has absolutely no idea if those characters are actually properly drawn, or if it means peace and serenity, or means Bob's Noodle Shop. And <laughs> the European markings on these pistols are the same thing. The typical Chinese user of the pistol isn't going to be able to tell if it says Mauser or if it says Wowser because the M is stamped upside down as a W. How much of that was trying to copy existing markings to make the gun look identical? How much of it was perhaps an element of superstition that these markings have an actual function in how the gun works? I'm sure there was an element of that. How much, you know, what the balance is between those two factors, I I can't say. All I could say is those some of those were uh quite amusing <laughs> oh it's great the, some of them are some of them are just so close to really perfectly duplicating say fn or mauser company mar uh, logos or markings and some of them are just completely off in left field so what was the setup for this period starting in 1916 what foreign weapons manufacturers have been operating in china since the qing dynasty began its military modernization efforts well, that's really where a lot of this story for the, the the armaments that these warlords had, a lot of it starts 50 years before the revolution. Um, during the, the self-strengthening movement in China, uh, you know, it's a reaction to foreign powers showing up with modern technology and really just pasting the, the Chinese fighting forces that they come in contact with, which, of course, spurs China to improve its own military capabilities. And that's when you'll see a multitude of arsenals begin to be set up in China. During that period, like between the 1860s and the 1890s, there were some 19 individual arsenals established in China, most of them towards the coast, but not exclusively. And these are often set up with foreign military assistance. There was a lot of German assistance at the time. German technical advisors would be brought over as China was being used sort of as a pawn between the European powers during this period, they you know, at, at various times, various powers would be inclined to help China modernize if they think that China is going to be an ally to them, or perhaps disincentivize China to modernize if they think that they can take advantage of something. So in the end, we see German support, we see some British support, we see American support at various times. Um, a lot of machine tooling brought in from Europe and the United States. Uh, you know, They may manufacture, of course, would manufacture the arsenal buildings domestically, but then they would bring in the machine tools from a company like Pratt & Whitney in the United States, which sold machine tools for manufacturing all sorts of things, including arms, all over the world. So it is the the formation of those arsenals is what put in place the foundation of the what the warlords were able to use to build their own armaments after the revolution. I see. Can you talk about the major government funded arsenals? Where were they located and what did they mainly manufacture? Were they controlled by the government or by the warlord, whoever controlled that territory at the time? Well, the original idea was the central government. Um, however, what the the central government came up with a plan for modernizing the military that would essentially defray the cost back onto each of the provinces. And the plan was to set up this set of new armies where each province would have two modernized standard divisions of troops. And the province would support the the recruitment and the training and the well, the ongoing 
support required to maintain those divisions. And generally, especially for the more well-to-do provinces, that would involve building uh, armories or arsenals, not necessarily to manufacture all the weapons, but certainly to maintain them, to store them. Uh, Some of them set up arsenals to manufacture ammunition. That was done in China during this period to some extent. Uh, And in places also setting up military academies to train officers and prepare men. And the idea was this would create a a very effective modern national military force that the national government didn't have to actually directly pay for itself. And then when you get the revolution, of course, the national government goes away effectively, and you're left with this military structure embedded in every individual province. And that is the unintended, the unintended consequence of that was largely the warlord era. All of a sudden you have these military provincial governors who have military forces that are supported directly by the province that have a personal loyalty to the provincial governor. They've got their own arms maintenance or arms manufacturing capability. Presto, they're all going to have a way to try and compete and try to take control of the whole country. Now for the laymen, you know, who are listening, what's the significance of the FN 1900 and the Mauser C96? Why these two models in particular, what's their background and why were they copied so extensively in China uh, during the warlord era? That is a fantastic question. And that in part is, was a, a huge part of what I was trying to find out writing this book. And I have a few answers, but I don't have all of them yet. So part of what I'm hoping is publication of this will help spur more research and more interest and draw out any records that may exist. But What I can tell you is um, what made the 1900 and the C-96 particularly popular guns is the fact that they were in China well before the revolution. So part of the establishment of the system of new armies was the Qing dynasty sending representatives to Europe and to the United States looking for small arms that it could purchase and adopt for use by its own forces and perhaps license for local manufacture. That was a relatively common thing at the time. There are some great records there. For example, there's a picture of Hiram Maxim in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he invented the Maxim gun, which was really the first modern effective machine gun. There's a picture of him with a couple of Qing dynasty, uh, basically sales representatives who showed up to try out his gun. And they had a great time. Basically, in the backyard of his factory, they found a tree that was about 12 inches in diameter and shot it down with a machine gun. And there's a, there's a picture that they took at the time. We know that Chinese government representatives showed up at at FN as well, and they certainly showed up at Mauser. There was a substantial amount of military support um, and industrial support for China at the end of the Qing dynasty by the German imperial government. And so the C-96 and the FN-1900 were two of the very earliest, truly practical, effective, reliable handgun. The handgun, as opposed to the revolver, the semi-automatic handgun, didn't really start to exist until about 1900. Um, The C-96 is 1896, and it really is the first commercially successful pattern. And so what I believe has happened is those two early guns came into China. They were effective. They were adopted by the Chinese military as it begins to try and strengthen itself and and adopt modern cutting-edge firearms. And by the time we get to the revolution, the ability to send out representatives and like research what's available and shop smart, basically, has kind of fallen apart with the, the fall of the imperial government. And so there's a lot of trust put in these guns that we have now. We know these patterns are good. We like them. We'd rather have this than take a chance with some other new thing, which maybe it won't work or maybe... It's some dealer 5,000 miles away in Europe who's just trying to fleece us and will sell us some junk. It's, you know, how do you tell? You you know, especially once you have warlords, you kind of get one chance to make a purchase. And if it goes badly, you know, you're not writing the guy a bad Yelp review. There's not really anything you can do about (laughs) it. And so I think it's a matter of we're accustomed to this, we like it, and we're going to stick with it. And so that's why... When we're not able to import a lot more of these guns, we'll start making them ourselves. And in some cases, even if they are being imported in other places, maybe here I am inland or 
I'm a warlord who doesn't have a whole lot of money uh, and I can't afford to buy a big purchase of, of modern guns from Germany. So I'll have my craftsmen at my little arsenal put together 10 or 20 or 100 of them. How did so many of these pistols from the warlord era uh, make it to these shores here in the United States? Another excellent question. Um, Most of the time, we don't know. But I have some good theories. Uh, There are some facts that we do know for sure. And one is, there are not very many of these pistols in the United States compared relative to how many were initially manufactured. So, for example, we're talking hundreds of thousands of legitimate German Mauser pistols shipped to China. And there's nowhere near that many that have come back into the US. So the way that they did come in with Mauser pistols, they were often imported through a formal legal process as late as the 1980s and 1990s. These guns remained in China. Uh, They remained in use in China, although obsolete. And once, uh, when it became feasible to do so, there are a number of companies in the United States who went to China looking for surplus guns to purchase, to bring back, to sell on the American commercial market. And what would happen is they would be buying a lot of German C96 pistols because those are popular here in the US. They're known to be a historically interesting and a reliable firearm. But a lot of Chinese copies would get mixed in because the people doing the sourcing and the shipping, and frankly, they either couldn't tell the difference or just didn't care. The guns are very good copies of each other. And so a lot of them came in that way. And it's interesting, you can tell those because they actually have import markings on them. Um, That was required by the US government to mark the company and the location of import. And so you'll find Chinese made guns uh, that are typically import marked as being made in Germany, because they're copies of Mauser pistols and the person doing the import didn't recognize the difference. A lot of the totally unique the, the, what I think of as the true warlord era unique little pistols, um, came back as souvenirs with combat veterans. Uh, U.S. soldiers from World War II brought them back. Uh, we had a couple in the collection for this book that actually had uh, formal paperwork that was issued at the end of World War II, allow, you know, authenticating that this soldier is allowed to bring this pistol with this serial number back as a trophy. And so we see a number of Chinese pistols coming back that way. There was U.S. presence limited, but there was U.S. presence in China during World War II. And there was also, I'm quite sure, a a not trivial number that were taken as trophies by Japanese soldiers and then brought back to Japan, where they were subsequently taken again as trophies or as souvenirs by American soldiers in the occupation of Japan. We can see that that may sound like a a pretty extensive trail of, of ifs, But we've seen that absolutely take place for other conflicts like Vietnam, where we can see, in fact, one of the pistols in this book has American bring back papers from Vietnam, where it was in China for some time and eventually made its way into Vietnam, uh, where it was then captured by an American soldier during the Vietnam War. And I think that is the primary source of importation of those pistols into the United States. Were the uh, Mauser C96 and FN type pistols used differently? So yeah, the the C96 and the FN type pistols definitely were used differently. Um, And in fact, actually, what's kind of interesting is among the unique Chinese copies, we see pistols made uh, for both purposes. So the C96 was seen as sort of a a light assault carbine isn't really quite the right word, but it was a, a light, handy, close range stormtrooper sort of firearm. Um, And there were units of the Chinese armies that were equipped exclusively with those. And in fact, you can find a lot of photographs of C-96 Mausers in military hands. And there are some of the Chinese domestic designed pistols that are of similar setup. So you'll find them with longer barrels, with larger magazines, and with shoulder stock attachments. Uh, Sadly, we were only able to find one of these that actually still had its original shoulder stock but a substantial number of them that were cut with a a, a locking slot to attach a shoulder stock. Uh, A couple of them, in fact, sidetrack slightly. The original FN 1900s, on the grip panels, they were embossed with a logo or a a picture of the FN 1900. So sort of a meta recursive thing there. Um, And we see that copied on a lot of the Chinese pistols. They'll include a, a picture of the pistol on the grips of the pistol. But there are a couple where you'll see the picture of the gun shown with a shoulder stock attached to it. So we may not always, we may not generally be able to find the original shoulder stocks, but we see pictures of them right there on the gun, which is kind of cool. 
So the C-96 and the guns modeled after it were used as combat weapons. Uh, the FN 1900, much more of an officer's sidearm, probably not going to be used very much. And I think that that's the role that most of the Chinese domestic pistols went to. Uh, these other designs that, that aren't copies of anything in specific. They were, they're typically small, typically 32 caliber like the FN 1900, and they, they would have been an officer's sidearm. Uh, or possibly a defensive weapon. If you had access one way or another, if you were perhaps a slightly wealthier, uh, a soldier from a slightly wealthier family and had the means to acquire a pistol um, just for personal protection, um, I could see these pistols being used in that role as well. And can you say anything about the quality of the ammunition that was produced in China for these pistols specifically? China invented gunpowder, so you figure it should, in theory, should have been pretty good. Like the guns themselves, the ammunition quality varied pretty widely. Um, there was so we <laughs> we see these pistols uh, using primarily two different cartridges. They're either 32 ACP, um, aka 7.65 millimeter Browning, or they are 7.63 millimeter Mauser or 30 Mauser. Um, the 30 Mauser is from the C96. The 32 is from the FN 1900. Uh, as far as I've been able to tell, there are some resources, there are some reference works written on Chinese ammunition from this period. Nobody has been able to identify formal arsenal produced Chinese 32 caliber ammunition. We know a bunch of it was imported. Uh, it was imported from Germany. Uh, it was imported from the UK. It was imported from Belgium at various times. And what's interesting is cartridge collectors have dug up a substantial number of fake 32 caliber ammunition where it's it's 32 auto but it's the head stamp on it is a faked copy of a european head stamp just like we see with the pistols so you'll see fn you know a typical fn head stamp on 32 would be the letter f the letter n and a two like a two-year date code and you'll find those that were made by some chinese factory where it's an f and then the n has been stamped backwards and a date code that's fairly prevalent on the 32 ammunition, which kind of makes sense to me. The 32s are guns that were not really serious combat weapons. There wasn't going to be a need for a lot of ammunition for them. So the wealthier warlords would simply buy a batch of it rather than try and spin up production of their own. The poorer warlords would make, you know, they had a, a less capable facility manufacturing it that was trying to make it look like imported ammo. Uh, 30 Mauser, there was definitely quite a lot of imported as well as being made by legitimate, proper Chinese arsenals. Uh, and so some of that you will you can see out there in the, the cartridge collecting literature. Um, the one solid number I've been able to dig up, uh, by 1937, something like 20% of ammunition used in China was manufactured in China. And it probably wasn't higher than that earlier during the warlord era. So predominantly, we're talking about imported ammo. But again, that's for rifles. You're, you're having most of the ammunition that you're shooting in the armies in this period was rifle ammunition, rifles and machine guns. The pistols weren't going through that much. So, so out in the field of battle, how easy was it to repair a pistol or rifle that failed? Was this something that any soldier knew how to repair or troubleshoot? Probably not. Um, there are different sorts of failures in firearms if the gun simply malfunctions it's easy enough to take the you know eject the cartridge and put in you know load a new cartridge and try again and typically that's the sort of thing that will happen if a gun gets dirty or dropped in the mud or hasn't been cleaned in a very long time now with these warlord pistols it's a little harder because first off being generally handmade we really don't know and the users wouldn't have known what the heat treating was like. So if you're making a firearm that's going to have to withstand significant pressures and, and parts of it are moving very quickly when it fires, the quality of the material that it's made out of is very important. And the manufacturing itself, you know, are the parts all cut to the right tolerances? That's important. But heat treating is also equally important. Uh, typically with a pistol, you'll, you'll cut the parts out of a relatively soft steel first so that they're easy to manufacture and then you'll harden that steel through a heat treating process it is far more likely that a lot of these pistols were improperly or never heat treated and that will lead to parts bending or breaking with sustained use on top of that because these are all individually manufactured pistols you can't just swap out a part so if you have 
your standard issue rifle as a soldier and something breaks on it, the extractor breaks. Well, there's probably another one that you can get that part off of and just put that part into your gun and then it'll work. Typically the sort of thing that an armorer would do or a, a, a small refurbishment depot, but it could be easily done. With the pistols, you're going to probably have to have someone manufacture a new part for you from scratch because there is no standard model for the pistol or for any of its component parts. If that thing breaks in the field, find a new one, basically. <laughs> uh, we actually have one of the guns in the book where the front of the slide is visibly bent up because every time it fires, that slide hits into the back of the frame. And it's been fired enough by somebody that that slide is actually starting to bend. And uh, for these pistols that appear are photographed in the book, any of them, to the best of your knowledge, still operable? Yes, I can attest directly <laughs> that at least one of them is, uh, because I actually took one of these pistols out to a local shooting match here, uh, filmed it. Uh, by the time this podcast is up, I expect that video is actually live and visible. Now, the gun that I took out was one of the small batch, uh, small number that were actually manufactured in quantity by a real arsenal. Uh, and in this case, it was a pistol manufactured by the Shanghai Arsenal. It is... It's one of my favorite designs in the book. It is mechanically based on the FN-1900, but it was intended to be a combat weapon. It's got a much longer barrel, it's got a longer grip and a longer magazine, and it's got an attachment slot for a shoulder stock. Sadly, I don't have the shoulder stock. Uh, it's got a rear sight that can be adjusted for shooting out to 500 meters, which is incredibly optimistic. But um, I took that pistol out to a shooting match and it ran not quite perfectly, but very, very well. Um, I actually placed quite well in the match too, which was a, a nice surprise. So what do you know about all the various arsenals? I mean, I'm aware of the ones at Daku and uh, uh, Taiyuan, Hanyang. What, what can you tell me about these uh, Chinese arsenals? I can tell you a little bit. So I didn't focus on the arsenals themselves. Most of the information we have, and we do have information on a lot of them, um, in particular, once you get later into this period, into the 1930s, there are foreign emissaries and, and representatives who are periodically sending intelligence reports back to places like the United States talking about what is China's uh, you know, military capacity. And so they'll talk about especially the larger arsenals. But those reports tend to focus on things like rifles and artillery. And virtually none of the, the documentation that I had access to mentions pistols. They will occasionally mention Mauser pistols, um, because as we've said, those were treated more like combat weapons. But when it comes to these, the, the small handmade pistols, there's virtually no reference. Now, in the book, um, we have, because we cover copies of the C96, and that was more commonly manufactured by the large arsenals, we do have some that we know are from specific arsenals. Taku is a good example. They marked some of their guns, sometimes in Chinese. Some of them are actually marked in English, Taku Naval Dockyard. Now, we've got some of those in the book. The Shanghai Arsenal marked its guns in Chinese on the grip panels, and we've got a couple examples of those. The Taiwan Arsenal did, again, marked its pistols, some of its pistols in Chinese. So on those, we generally have some sort of information about quantities that were manufactured, and those are generally earlier production guns. Like the Shanghai pistol I just mentioned that I was shooting myself uh, was manufactured, if I remember correctly, in 1916. Production for that whole model was basically like 1911 through 1916. The well-made Arsenal pistols are generally pretty early in this period. In handling some of the pieces from this collection, you know, what you've uh, acquired on your own and, you know, the ones loaned for the purposes of producing this book, do you ever wonder about the history of the individual guns? Do you ever think about the stories they might yield, who used it, who handled it, what action did it see? Absolutely. Uh, it's really unfortunate that there's just no way for us to ever find out. But these guns to me have even, I think about that with a lot of different firearms from all, all different places and all different parts of history. But these Chinese pistols in particular have so much potential for 
fascinating stories behind them. Um, just to pull out a couple examples, we have one picture in the book of a pistol that has grips on it, where instead of a typical little grip screw escutcheon, someone has replaced those with coins. And they are Japanese occupation currency from the early 1940s. And I would love to know that, like, what were the circumstances? Was this a pistol that was captured by a Japanese soldier and, and put together like that? Was it something that was done? Was there a significance to those specific coins in the hands of a Chinese soldier who put them into those grips? I'll never know. Um, we have a pistol in the book that has some some carving in the grips that includes what I think is a name, but the characters are so worn down that it's just not legible anymore. You know, who was that? It's a incredibly weird, interesting pistol to begin with. And then it's got this personalized marking on the grip that we just can't identify. One of the pistols, one of the C96s, when we were taking it apart to look at the inside, we pulled the grip panels off and out comes this little rolled up scrap of paper that with three lines of Chinese writing that is, as best I can tell, a permit to own this pistol from the 1970s. And this is a gun that was manufactured in a warlord arsenal in probably the 1920s. But it's been around. It went through the warlord era. It went through the Chinese Civil War. It went through at least two decades of communist China. And eventually it got imported into the U.S. And I can only imagine the stories behind that gun. If only they could speak. How can other collectors who have additions to the models you've shown in the book contact you? Well, uh, there are a number of places that you can see my stuff and reach me through Forgotten Weapons. In the case of Chinese pistols, probably the best contact address would be info at Headstamp Publishing. I would love to get more information, especially if it turns out that there is a pattern that I missed or what's really tantalizing if someone out there actually has some written record uh, or or even you know authoritative oral tradition record knowing where some of these guns came from, who they were made for, exactly when they were made. We know the general idea, but any records that were associated with these pistols, so far as I have been able to tell, have been lost or destroyed. Um, I've talked to a number of groups in China during the course of writing this and came to the conclusion that we know as much or more in the American collecting community about the history of these guns as anyone in China does, which is really unfortunate. But that's part of my hope in, in publishing the book is to bring bring these things a little bit more to light. And hopefully we can dig up some information. So info at Headstamp Publishing, if you have something, I would love to hear it. Great. Well, hopefully this uh, our little talk will generate some some interest and some long lost uh, collectors out there will will uh, reach out to you. Well, Ian, this flew by. You know, uh, in the uh, China History podcast, I talk about wars and battles, but never down to the tactics or the actual tools of battle. There's an old uh, Chinese saying, "Zo ma kan hua." to view the flowers while riding a horse. So this has been a, a real treat to <laughs> get back to the warlord era. And instead of galloping through those years from 1916 to 1930, it was a pleasure to stop and focus on one aspect of you know the great mosaic of Chinese history. Now, besides James Rupley's photography, I have to say the diagrams you provide throughout the book are so helpful and educational to someone such as myself, you know, who isn't familiar with the subject of firearms. You made it so much easier to understand the mechanics and manufacturing techniques. And the introductory remarks at the beginning uh, explained a lot and uh, served me well in better understanding the wealth of content provided in the book. Your CV and bona fides and what you've accomplished to date and your contributions to the scholarship of these historic weapons is most admirable. The repository of videos on your Forgotten Weapons YouTube channel is such a valuable contribution to the understanding and scholarship of military history and the development of firearms manufacturing. And with this new book, you you have coming out, Pistols of the Warlords, Chinese Domestic Handguns, 1911 and 1949. You're making a contribution as well to something that up till now, it didn't get the attention it deserved. If anyone is looking to get copies of the book when it comes out, where should they uh, go look? 
Well, until uh, the 19th of June, or the 18th of June, I'm sorry, uh, we have a Kickstarter pre-launch running. Um, the books are discounted for pre-order there, and there are also some special versions and special extra offers that we have available for people. Once the Kickstarter closes, uh, we will then be offering the books at the standard retail price uh, through our website, which is headstamppublishing.com. Uh, we're anticipating to have the, the books in from the publisher or from the printer uh, and shipping out to people in December of this year. That's the plan. So check out the Kickstarter or and or the website. All right. I'll have all that info uh, in the show notes accompanying this program. Okay, Mr. Ian McCollum, I know you're a busy man. This has been one of the pleasures of my life, getting to know you and how you've inadvertently served as my gateway into something that's of great interest to me now. So I uh, thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it really has been a pleasure. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce this, what I think is a really fascinating subject, to people who um, hadn't had a way to experience it. So remember... Everything you need to know about every episode of every show in the uh, Teacup Media Empire can be found at the website at teacup.media, and you'll find a uh, 10-part series that I did covering the history of the Warlord era. So that's over at the uh, website, teacup.media. My deepest thanks, as always, everyone, for tuning in. I hope you all enjoyed this special CHP episode. I'll be bringing you more in the months and years to come. Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from Los Angeles, California. Do consider coming back next time. You're cordially invited, I'll tell you that much, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.